Um, my name is Mitch Muncy. I'm the Application Engineering Manager over at NEI Software. Uh, today's presentation is FEA for Engineering Managers. Uh, I know FEA can be interesting across the organizations. Can I get a, just for my own curiosity, can I get a show of hands of how many people in the audience are engineering managers? Okay, that's pretty good. It looks like a good split. Uh, the, the way that I structured the presentation is it's meant to be a, an introduction on FEA, so it has uh, appeal for everybody, but it also has tidbits in there that are specific for engineering managers. All right, so I wanted to start today's presentation with a, a, a very difficult question that's been bugging me for years, which is, wh why do firemen get all the attention? All right. You know, it's uh, us engineers, we save lives too. Um, yet, all the kids want to be firemen when they, want, when they grow up. And uh, every girl I know goes crazy when they see a fire truck. And I don't, I don't understand it. Um, the, uh, I think some of you guys here know what I'm talking about. The fire truck drives by, the girl, the girl will go, woo, you know? I, I don't know the last time someone said woo when I did anything. So. Uh, right about now, I'd like to take a, just a second and, and pause and let you guys know I am kidding. I do know firemen put their lives on the line. They, uh, they're out there doing uh, crazy things, pulling, uh, climbing big tall ladders to save uh, kittens out of trees or what it looks like burning buildings. Um, but it's, it's, I don't want you to get confused with my respect and my admiration that I have for my fellow engineers for the, the beautiful products that they make and also the chances that they take to, to save lives as well. All right. So let's, let's get into some of the benefits of FBA. It's not always about saving lives, but there are some other things that are important as well. Uh, the key thing that we always focus on is, is avoiding some part of failure, uh, or at least reducing the chances of it. We know it's, we can't make everything perfect, but we want to know before we send it out there that we're uh, not going to get into a lot of trouble. Now, the next two, uh, building less costly prototypes and um, shortening the development cycle, those two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, I'll talk about those in just a second. Um, for me as an engineer, it's, it's critical to go after the optimal design. Uh, and to me, FBA being able to help out with that is, is uh, very great. Because typically what we do for a design process is we're given an envelope, we have to design into that envelope and then after we hit our, our numbers, we, there's not much iterations beyond that. Um, with FEA and optimization, you can set the computer to run, up, run overnight and do thousands of different design iterations while you're sleeping and actually come up with a, a better, more efficient design. So that's one of the other things I like about FEA. And finally, if you're building better parts, you're not wasting, uh, you're not building a bunch of prototypes that you don't need. You're, you're contributing less waste. All right, so let's, let's get to the, the talk about the prototypes. Now, the, the key thing that they, they focus on, this is the research done by the Aberdeen Group uh, a couple years ago, and what they found is that companies using FEA on average will build 1.6 prototypes less per project than some, a company that doesn't use FEA. And that translates to a couple different things. In, for you guys, the engineering managers out there, you know how much each one of those prototypes costs. You can multiply it times 1.6. You've got a pretty good understanding of just how much money this can save you. Uh, for those of you that, that don't have that information, this is how the Aberdeen uh, group broke it down. Uh, we have the products of low complexity, which are less than 50 parts. They take you know, about a week to make. Uh, and the cost to build a prototype, a single prototype for that, is about $7,000. Now I did you guys a favor, I went out and added cost savings. If we were going to say 1.6 prototypes, you know what that means per project. Uh, and so it can be anywhere from $12,000 on up to about $2 million to, to save uh, on just on prototype costs alone. And like I was saying, this kind of goes hand in hand with shortening the development cycle because the same idea, if you can do 1.6 less prototypes, you can save the amount of time you have de designing those prototypes, building those prototypes, and testing those prototypes. Uh, and it's the same kind of concept. It goes anywhere from 21 days up to almost half a year as far as time savings. All right. 
So now that we've talked about the nice things about FVA, let's talk about some of the things that why people don't want to use it. Uh, and this is typically when I like going around the room and asking to see what, what fears people have. Uh, I know I don't have a lot of time today, so I'm just going to throw the big three that I know that I've encountered a number of times right now, okay? The first one is I always get is that it's too hard or it's too confusing to use. And so people are, are, don't want to get into it. Um, the next one is that it's expensive. And finally, it's not accurate or you just can't trust the results. So those are the, the big three that I always run into. And now, having worked in the tech support side for a number of years, I know there's a little bit of truth to, to some of these. Okay, so let's talk about each one of those different fears and kind of break it down. The first thing that it's difficult is something I can understand when you start to look at just how difficult doing FBA can be uh, and looking at it from the analysis side. Um, here's a slide I actually borrowed from one of our training classes we're doing. We have a intro to FBA training class that goes into the math behind it. The, the approaches that we use and really why you're doing anything in FVA. It's an online training class that we're offering here. In a, I think it's early next week. In fact, I've got invitations for anybody that's interested. Just see me afterwards and I can give you one of these. You can join the webinar. Um, but, uh, you know, Bart McFeeders, who's the engineer that's going to be giving that presentation, is uh, very experienced and I probably won't be doing him justice, but uh, let's run through just the basic process. The first step is to discretize the structure. That means take your model, break it down into the nodes and elements. Uh, and typically where people get confused here is picking the right type of elements. And I'll talk a little, a little bit about that later. Uh, next is to choose the displacement function, you know, how we're going to, uh, to, to solve that. Next we have to do our stress and strain relationships. So usually this is tied to some kind of material model that we're picking. Then we have to construct the element stiffness matrix. Okay, uh, there's a different, couple different methods that we use for that. And then we have to take that element stiffness matrix and turn it into a global stiffness matrix and apply our loads. Then finally, we have to solve for the unknown displacements. Each one of our uh, nodes turns, our degrees of freedom turns into a, a, an equation that we need to solve. And then finally, once we've solved those displacements, we can turn everything into the stress or the strain. All right, so that's, and if, you know, looking at that, that could be a very confusing process. Now, that's exactly what the computer's doing. That's not what people see anymore. I mean, as the software has been, it's finite element analysis started in the 1940s. Uh, so there's a theory and a method for just about anything. And if it's not out there yet, they're, they're currently developing it. Um, and so it, it, it can be very confusing once you start getting into the nuts and bolts of actually what it's doing. But if you look at it from the user perspective, it's a much different process. Uh, it's just a matter of taking your geometry. You can either create it in the CAD system or it, do it directly in the, the finite element analysis program. Uh, a lot of them have that geometry creation capability. You have a, a material or a property that you want to apply. Those usually have a library that they're a part of. Um, generate your mesh, create a load, create a constraint, solve it, and then view the results. So, it's a, it's a much simpler process. You don't have to worry about choosing a displacement function. You don't have to worry about you know, the, the methods that it uses to solve the displacements, if it's Gaussian elimination or what. It's, it's something that's taken care of by the solver. So as the finite element analysis, the, the methods grow, the software has been growing with it, and it makes it much easier to use. So that takes us to our next uh, concern, which is the accuracy of the results. Now, this is a scenario that I'm all too familiar with. It it's usually happens, someone's brand new to FEA, uh, they haven't read any books, haven't taken any classes on it, uh, they don't take the training classes that it's offered by the vendor, uh, they don't go through any of the tutorials. Instead, they fire up the software, they load their big giant CAD model in there, poke their way through the menus, and eventually get to some form of results. And then they look at the results and they go, wow, I'm off by a factor of 100%. <laughs> and it's like, OK, so what's the verdict? Obviously, the software is the fault. There's nothing, it's nothing that we did. It's the, it's the software's fault. Sure, it put people in space, but it didn't work for my bracket. You know, uh, that's kind of the, the approach that we come to. Now, of course, I'm a little bitter you know, being on the, the software side. So let's be a little fair. And this is an example that I actually ran through. This is something that we did with a, a university 
with a composite structure where the uh, students built and tested. I did the FE analysis on it, and uh, the analysis that we did showed that it was going to hold a load that's about twice as much as it actually did. So the verdict for me is, aside from looking silly, is the fact that uh, if you get your uh, composite materials for free, you usually get what you pay for. Um, and in this case, the, the material properties didn't match what the manufacturer had sent. And so we kind of learned that the hard way. But that kind of takes us to the next aspect, which is now, okay, if it's not accurate, how do we go ahead and make sure that we ensure that level of accuracy? And there's, I, there's a probably 10 times as many things that I have here, but I grabbed, again, grabbed the key, the, the key parts of it. The first one is your element selection. Uh, that usually means if you got a plate looking structure, make it out of plates. If you got something that looks like beams, make it out of beams. Make sure you're using the proper type of elements to model your joints. Um, but that also brings up probably one of my favorite quotes when it comes to FBA, which is, if you can't build a good model, build a big one. And what that refers to is the, there's a solid element, the tetrahedral 10 element, that works for just about anything, as long as you use enough of them. Uh, the only downside there is if you're using uh, TET 10 elements for anything, you might be making models that are 100 times or 1,000 times bigger than they really need to be, but it's very easy to do. So uh, that's one thing that, that they've done for that. Uh, the next part is the material, just like we we're talking about. You have to make sure that you've got the right material properties. You can't always take the manufacturer's word for it. There's usually a lot of people are doing coupon testing to validate the materials or some, some form of testing to validate the material properties that they have and also making sure that we have the right material model. If we need to include plasticity or even hyperelasticity or whatever it needs to be to make sure we're accurately capturing the way the model should be behaving. All right, the next one I threw up there is mesh quality. Um, that is another one of my favorite quotes, which is, uh, if you know what you're doing with FEA, you can make the results say just about anything. Uh, and that's probably because of the mesh quality. If you mesh it too fine, or mess it too coarse, you can definitely jump right over the, the, the results that you're looking for. So it's always important to make sure that you have the right uh, number of nodes and elements in the areas that you're, you're mostly interested in. Uh, and the other aspect of that is these FVA theories and, and methods that they're using are always assuming that you have the perfectly shaped quad element, the perfectly shaped brick element. Uh, and when it comes to meshing really complex structures, they're not always like that. So it's always important to look at your mesh in the areas that are critical and making sure that the elements aren't too warped or too skewed or anything like that. And a lot of the, the software will have ways of, of handling that. Okay. Uh, the last big one, and I say it's probably the big one, it's probably the place that you start thinking about first, which is the analysis type. Uh, that, and that just means, do you need to use a linear static analysis or should you be making it a nonlinear analysis or do you have nonlinear effects? Uh, can you look at a, a modal analysis and just look at the natural frequencies? Is that going to be able to tell you enough information about the model or does it need to be a full-on dynamic analysis? Uh, and then the last bit is just some additional considerations. They're not critical for, for ensuring accuracy, but it's definitely things that you want to look at when you're, you're trying to figure out the best approach to use uh, when you're anal uh, analyzing something, which is first you're, you're trying to figure out the degrees of freedom because if that measures how the size of your model, how long it's going to take to run, in some cases if it's even going to run. If it's way too big, it might not work. Um, the, the next thing is, is symmetry. And I think that's probably the, one of the, the um, most undervalued aspects in finite element analysis, which is if you've got a truly symmetric model, the geometry is symmetric, the loads, the constraints, everything is symmetric about one or three planes, you can immediately cut it in half. That cuts down the number of degrees of freedom that you need, and it also uh, increases the model stability. And the downside is when you go show, you show, go show your boss the picture, they're like, what will happen to the other half? You know, well, mathematically, it's the same. Um, and the last one is for the guys out there that might be building these huge assembly models and trying to run it through the software. I've seen it a couple times where people have run into situations where it just gets too, too big to run. And the idea that you want to use is instead of just doing a, a global model with all the detail built into it, is you can go ahead and build a global model which takes out a lot of the detail, still gives you the right displacements, you got the right mass in there, you got the right stiffness, you're getting a lot of the right results. And then once you've identified the areas of that model that you think are, are critical, you can go ahead and do a sub-model and build a local model in that area with all the detail, include other effects like contact and things like that that might take a little bit longer to solve. 
but uh, but be able to do it that way. So it's a, it's a two-step approach. Instead of trying to spend two weeks trying to do a very large model, you spend a couple of days doing a, 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 a comparative big one and then a couple of days doing you know, the, the smaller ones. All right, and the, I think the last concern is just that FBA is expensive. And I think in the past that used to be true, but it's just flat out wrong today. Um, there are a number of free codes out there that are open source that you can go ahead and use that are very valuable. Uh, and even the commercial codes that are out there, they start at a couple thousand dollars. And if we look at the benefits that we were talking about earlier, uh, it's, it's greatly outweighed by the, the costs. All right. Um, one of the most difficult questions that I'm asked uh, is, you know, which product is right for me? And for that, I've got an extremely simple graphic. <laughs> so, uh, and the way that I, that I set it up is, it, it comes down to how much you want to invest in the product. And it's not talking about financially, it's really how much you want to sit down and learn the product, how, many, how often you're going to be using it, uh, and things like that, because that figures out how difficult the product should be. So if, if you're a casual user, you're not going to be using it very often. On the left-hand side here, it's a very easy product to use, but might not have all the functionality that's out there. So it makes it, it's kind of the trade-off that you have. Then on the other hand, if you're going to be abusing the software on a daily basis, you want it to do some pretty crazy things, then you're on the other side of the curve. So it's kind of a, a nice way of thinking about which one would be right for you. All right, and now, so let me just jump into a couple examples that we have. This is from uh, one of our, our customers doing wind turbines and focusing specifically on the blades. Uh, these are large composite structures that are very difficult to manufacture. Uh, so if you screw one up, you really don't want to do it twice. Uh, so often what they'll do is they'll do a lot of FEA on it just to make sure that they get the right uh, size, they get the right stiffness. Uh, and one of the key things that, that goes wrong with these blades is it's, it's cracking of the blade. And so they'll do a lot of virtual testing to make sure they've got the right layups, the right orientations, and things like that. Uh, it, it, and it saves a lot of time and money as well. Uh, here's another example. It's a spinal implant screw. This is one where you don't want to be doing a lot of physical testing. Uh, and this specific customer, they were using the FBA. This is a nonlinear analysis with a lot of contact. It's very difficult to solve, but they were able to use this to save six months of development time and roughly $60,000 worth of uh, uh, prototypes just by do it using the FBA. Okay. And before I jump into the questions, I do want to invite you guys again. Come check us out. I know the show's just about over, but we're over here at booth. Uh, 3501. In fact, just remember 3500, and we're just right down the, the, the way here. Uh, it's on the way out. Or if you can't do that, go ahead and visit us at neisoftware.com. And like I said, we do have a intro to FDA training class that we're going to be giving for free. It uh, really goes through the theories, the, the approaches that we did in a lot more detail. And it's going to be uh, here next week. I think it's Tuesday at 10 o'clock. So if you're interested in that, just stop by and I'll give you an invitation with the link and you can check that out. All right, uh, is there any, any questions? Okay. Well, great, thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>